So even though we've now got a complete proof of my statement of the inverse function theorem, um, we'll compare it to the slightly different standard statement uh, at the end, it's really nice to see um, another proof of the, this key subtle point of f being an open map, in other words, locally surjective. And this compares to the method two from this first video of how do you practically solve nonlinear problems. And one really good way is iteration towards a fixed point. So there, the technique was starting with f of x, we want to solve y equals f of x. We want to find an x that solves y equals f of x. We create a new map, phi y of x, which is x minus f of x plus y. And now, if that's equal to x, we want to find a fixed point of that. If that's equal to x, clearly y is going to equal f of x. Okay. Now, this requires a little bit of a modification of what we what the situation we had. Remember, we have f from u to r n, and I've been emphasizing how even though these this lives, this is a subset of r n. These don't have to be the same r n. They can have different units. They can have different physical meaning. There's nothing really saying they're the same, except they happen to have the same dimension, so that the derivative map can be uh, one to one and onto it can be an isomorphism. Um, but here, it's just not going to make any sense to subtract f of x from x unless they really are the same kind of thing, unless they're, they're in the same copy of r of rn. The other thing is that how does how do we how are we sure that this is going to have a fixed point? We're going to want this to be a contraction mapping. And remember, that's just a particular kind of Lipschitz mapping, where the Lipschitz constant is less than one. So Lipschitz ideas still totally come into this part, even though it's not going to be in quite the same way as we've seen in the rest of it. Um, but this guy, f of x, all we know is its derivative is invertible. That doesn't necessarily mean it's close to the identity function. It just means it's close to some invertible linear map, namely its own derivative. So we just have to engineer things a little bit. So here's an exercise for you. Okay, and that's so we can do, and this is this is actually useful in itself, and it, it's often at the very start, start of a proof of the inverse function theorem, you'll often see this step done. I haven't done it since it's not really necessary until this point, and only in this version of the theorem. Um, and that's saying it's enough to show, or let's say, let me give myself some room, use it a different standard stock phrase, um, oops, you don't want to see that it's from the other one. Okay. Um, without loss of generality, I don't know if you can hear Jerry Mulligan in the background, but I uh, thought that'd be kind of fun. Actually, I just was listening to it and I left it on. Uh, without loss of generality, we can assume, we can just prove this in the special case where x naught, our base point that we're working around, uh, is equal to 0, and that f of x naught, in other words y naught, is equal to 0, and that the derivative at 0, at our base point, is equal to the identity matrix. Okay. <coughs> and the hint for this exercise is you can translate the function without doing anything to its derivative or whether it's one-to-one -one or onto invertible and you can also compose with kind of doing most of it for you here okay the reason I wanted to do, want to give this away a little bit is this idea that we're gonna take our function f which was going from one space to another and here's our x naught and our y naught, and we're actually going to compose with the inverse of the derivative, that's a linear transformation, to get a map that goes from a space to itself. And that's the only way you're going to get fixed points and the contraction mapping thing happening. Okay, So that's another one I might uh, write out explicitly, might show you explicitly in a hint exercise solution video, but it's not super hard to show that. So from now on we're going to assume that f of 0 equals 0, the df at 0 is the identity, and that we just need to show, need to show that for y near enough to 0, 
we can solve y equals f of x. Okay, so now we create phi y of x is x minus f of x plus y. Okay, so what do we need? We need to show, we need a domain, an explicit domain for phi y, and it needs to be a closed set, and it's going to be a closed ball. Okay, and we need to know uh, that uh, phi y maps that domain, let's call it D, to itself. And we need to know that phi y is a contraction mapping. And that's the interesting part. And that's the Lipschitz condition that has come into so much of the other stuff in the proof. Okay, so <laughs> the key is that now the derivative of f is the identity map, so near at zero. So zero near zero, f of x should be behaving a lot like the identity map. So this should be behaving be behaving like the zero map plus a constant. Well, that should vary slowly when you vary its inputs. In other words, it should be Lipschitz with a small Lipschitz constant. And as long as we're careful about the details, we should be able to make it a contraction mapping. Okay, so. <coughs> Here's the claim. Let's say this is another exercise. If you, yeah, just it, it's an exercise. You might be able to do it in your head. Um, there is an R greater than zero such that uh, df of x, the norm of the difference of these two matrices is less than or equal to one half for all x within r of zero in the ball at uh, center zero radius r okay and hence by everybody's favorite fundamental result in calculus phi y is one half Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant, Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant, one half. In other words, it's a contraction mapping. In the the main thing is that's less than one. But it's just easy. Just pick any number like you like less than one. One half is the easiest one. Okay, not zero. That's not going to happen. Okay, <laughs> so this the hint here is this: you really do need to know that f is c one here, not just differentiable. But then when you walk away from x0, remember we know that at 0, the derivative is the identity map. We need to know when you walk away from that, it doesn't change radically. That's the C1 condition. OK. So Vy is a contraction mapping. OK. Another claim that's really easy to show is as long as we pick y, here's the 1 half coming in that's rather similar. It's like this 1 half. It's very similar to the 1 half in the other version. Um, Let's take this guy. This is going to be our crucial thing. The ball, oh, um, let's say this in the closed ball, because we really want to be able to have a closed set mapping to itself. Suppose we take y a little smaller, a little closer to 0 than that. Then I claim a pretty easy calculation tells you that phi y maps that closed ball of radius r to itself. OK, remember phi y involves x, f of x, which we just put some bounds on, uh, and y, and a tiny bit of work with mean value and um, triangle inequality just gives us this. Okay, so we've got our domain. It's a nice closed set, it's closed ball centered at the origin. We've got our contraction mapping phi y that goes from that set to itself. The contraction mapping principle which, of course, deeply depends on the completeness of the reals. Um, by contraction mapping principle, there is a fixed point of phi y. Therefore, that's exactly an x. There's nothing more nor less than an x with f of x equals to y. Okay, so 
if you just see this in isolation, it's a weird way to show the end of the proof or this key part of the proof. Often people do it first. Um, I like saving the hardest stuff for last. Um, but I wanted to, in the very first video, I wanted to give you a sense of, no, this is actually a reasonable thing to do. If you actually study practical methods of solving hard nonlinear problems, turning them into fixed point problems is really, really reasonable. Again, I'll mention uh, one other thing. I, I briefly alluded to method three for solving nonlinear problems, a much more sophisticated and powerful method is Newton's method that usually converges much, much faster than the ones, the other ones uh, I talked about. And this is mentioned in Hubbard and Hubbard um, as a, another key to the proof of the inverse function theorem. And they get a very hardcore version of it with very precise bounds on exactly how big various neighborhoods can be. Um, it's a little too much for me, I think, <laughs> for the first time you ever see this stuff. But it definitely should be mentioned as another th thing that can be the basis of this trickiest part of the inverse function theorem. Um, and there's deep relations between Newton's method and fixed point iteration. The, Newton's method is fixed point iteration with a particular kind of, of kind of more clever map than what was used here. Okay. Um, one last thing. Uh, I, I don't think I want to need to another, do another video. Um, so the usual statement. is we just assume that df at a particular point is invertible. We assume that f is um, c1 on a whole neighborhood, on its whole open set, but we only assume df of x0 is invertible. And then we conclude f is a local c1 diffeomorphism. And some textbooks don't trot out that terminology, but that's what they what they say. Um, on a neighborhood, well, really, they just say it is a C1 diffeomorphism, but only on some small neighborhood. Let's say V of X naught. So it's getting really wimpy. It's the last Sharpie I have here at home. So I was trying to... Believe it or not, it's a brown Sharpie. The, the color registration on this uh, document camera is just totally blue, blue shifted. It gets going near the speed of light, I guess. Speaking of blue, though, we'll try this. Um, so that's the usual statement that uh, if you just know it invertible at one point, then you can get that it's invertible with a C1 inverse on some small neighborhood, perhaps small, of, of X0. And I was assuming that df was invertible on all of u. And then I got a stronger statement. I, was, I got the statement that it's a local C1 diffeomorphism on all of u. Okay? So that just means near every point, you can get a neighborhood where it is a C1 diffeomorphism. Okay? So that's a very similar conclusion. But it seems like I was having to assume more that it was invertible everywhere instead of just at one point. But notice that if this um, is invertible, then there is some neighborhood V of x naught on which df of x is invertible. Okay, Just because the set of invertible matrices is open. And so if it's invertible at one point, it can't suddenly be invertible, arbitrarily, non-invertible, singular, arbitrarily close. And so it's going to be invertible nearby. And then suddenly you're in the situation that I've been, been working on. Hey, here's an open set on which it's invertible on the whole thing. So I prefer to go ahead and, and move to that case already. Let's just look at where it's invertible. Let's not just say, oh, it's special that it's invertible at this one point. Let's just see where it is invertible and where it's not. Wherever df of x is invertible, good things will happen. And the only thing is that if that set is too big for f to be globally one-to-one, -one, you just have to put in the word local here. But that's actually a very fundamental thing to talk about anyway. So anyway, that's the, the relationship between the two, the two theorems. It's not a very huge difference between the two versions. All right, hope you enjoyed.